Hello folks, and thanks for joining me for this reading, which will be a reread of, let's see here, let me get my act together here, of, uh, let's see, Pythagoras and the Ancient Mysteries, or as I like to call him, Pythagoras, uh, and by N.W.J. Hayden, Secretary uh, Toronto Society for Masonic Research and the material for this paper was not taken from any of the published lives of this ancient teacher its inspiration and part of its content is due to two articles entitled mysticism and science in the Pythagorean tradition which appeared in the classical quarterly of 1922-1923 from the pen of Professor F. M. Cornford of Trinity College, Cambridge, who, although not a Freemason, is an authority on philosophy and science amongst the ancient Greeks, and with several books to his credit. Of Pythagoras, as a citizen, we are told that he was born during the 6th century BC, but scholars differ over a range of 60 years as to just when. His parents were Greeks of high position and gave him the benefits of a liberal education. He repaid them by winning distinction as an athlete as well as in the fields of learning. He spent many years traveling in search of knowledge and visited, we are told, all the famous schools in the world of his time. Twenty-two years are said to have been passed in Egypt alone, where he endured many severe trials of body and mind in the temples of Heliopolis. Memphis and Thebes, for their priestly teachers were unwilling to expose their mystery to foreign eyes, and although Pythagoras came with letters of recommendation from both the reigning pharaoh and the ruler of his own state, his admission thereto was made extremely difficult, especially at Thebes. Any one who has tried to study that ancient Egyptian ritual, inaccurately known as the Book of the Dead, of which the Theban recension is the one generally known, will readily agree that these teachers quite thoroughly concealed their particular tenets under hieroglyphical figures, and taught their knowledge of those natural laws which govern this world by signs and symbols. It was expected that the Pythagorean system, or rather the system attributed to him, should have been established on a similar plan, and that many others of more recent times have copied this example, notably the Kabbalists and the original Rosicrucians of medieval Europe. So far as Freemasonry is concerned, there is a less direct reference to Pythagoras and his teachings in its literature than one could reasonably expect. The oldest reference is found in the second of our two earliest old charges that known as the Matthew Cook Miss and uh, from its first publisher and dated about 1425. The first or Regis Miss of about 1390 and mentions only the learned clerk Euclid of all of our ancient teachers prior to the Christian era. Uh, this Cook Miss mentions Pythagoras uh, twice, both quotations being ascribed to the Polychronicon or deeds of many times, compiled in eight books by Runolf Higden a monk who lived in what is now the city of Chester during the 14th century. The first quotation names Pythagoras as authority for the statement that Jubal, son of Lamech, founded the science and the art of music. The second states a great clerk that men called Pythagoras found one of the two antediluvian pillars set up by the three sons of Lamech to preserve their knowledge of the arts and sciences from being lost in the Noah Noachian flood or Noachian flood Noah's flood in other words uh, these legends were passed on with additions and changes in later copies of our old charges of which a hundred may have been discovered until we had come to the uh, illustrations of masonry composed by our famous brother uh, W.M. Preston who was born in Edinburgh in 1742 
like Pythagoras, he was the son of a man of wealth and learning, so that all the benefits of a liberal education and gained a national reputation as a literary authority during his long tenure of office as editor of the London Chronicle. In 1762, Preston was initiated in a Scottish lodge which met in London, but affiliated a few years later with one under the senior Grand Lodge of England, and on being elected its worshipful master, he set out to employ and instruct his brethren in Freemasonry in a manner never equaled in British Masonic history. The first edition of his illustrations was published in 1772. It created such a demand that twelve revisions and enlargements were brought out before his death in 1818, and several others since. As with the craft of today, such enthusiasm of more light was not shared by many, and one contemporary critic complains that Preston has lectured and sung us our, sung us our of the lodge, or out of the lodge, sorry spelling there, which may explain why the first English lodge of Masonic research, Couture Coronate, was not started until 1884. My reason for mentioning this work of Preston's is that gradual changes in the English language had made many of the words and names in old charges not only archaic, but even unrecognizable, thus causing some literary problems which have not all been solved as of yet. For example, the names of Mom, or Namus Gricus, Peter Gower, Lord Harnaster, and the Venetians in Euclid's time, and the broached Dornall. Preston devotes two pages of his illustrations to Pythagoras and states that to his discovery is attributed the 47th proposition of the first book of Euclid, which in geometrical solutions in demonstrations of quantities is of excellent use, and for which, in the joy of his heart, he said, or is said to have had, sacrificed a, a hecatomb. When T.S. Webb revised these illustrations for his first American edition to suit the needs of brethren in the newly formed United States, he added a quotation from Anderson that path Pythagoras also exclaimed Eureka, which in the Greek language signifies as I have found it. Preston also refers to the so-called Leland Lachmus for the question and answer, how come in yet to England, Peter Gower, a Grecian journeyed for I can't even pronounce that word, in Egypt, in Egypt and in Syria, and uh, in London, whereas the Venetians had planted uh, Macaroni, <laughs> he then says, I was puzzled to guess who Peter Gower could be, the name being perfectly English, or how a Greek should come by such a name. But he finally noted that the French pronunciation of Pythagora to conceive how such a mistake occurred. It was left to a later scholar, however, to solve the puzzle of the Venetians as being contemporaries with the ancient Greeks in another mispronunciation of the word Phoenicians. As English contemporary of Preston, W. M. Hutchinson, 1732-1814, also reproduced it in, its, in his Spirit of Mas Masonry, another valuable contribution to our literature. Mackey describes it as the first philosophical explanation of our symbolism, and Dr. Oliver says it explains, in a rational and scientific manner, the true philosophy of our order. In the second and third lectures of his book, Hutchinson discusses the teaching of Pythagoras at some length, including the 47th proposition, and the opinion is offered that from a great similitude in the principles of Pythagoreans and the Essenes, it seems as if they were derived from one origin. As to this, however, Gould, in his History of Freemasonry, Volume 1, quotes Jos Jos Josephus and Ginsberg to show that the Essenes were an offshoot from Judaism and cannot be traced before the second century BC. During the present century, however, there has been discovered evidence of a much greater antiquity for this 47th proposition than our early Masonic writers ever imagined. 
A great number of clay tablets were found in the ruins in Babylon by various groups of explorers, which are now preserved in the British Museum, Yale University, and University of Pennsylvania, and museums in Istanbul, Berlin, and elsewhere in Europe. Many of these tablets, on being translated, were found to be treatises on scientific subjects, such as arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, etc., and the detailed description of some of them is given by Professor R. C. Archibald of Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, in an article entitled Mathematics Before the Greeks, which appeared in Science for January in 1930. In it, he writes on page 116, for the history of the Pythagorean theorem, a portion of Akkadian tablet and in the Persian State Museum, dating back to 2000 B.C., is of special interest. It was published by Wiedner in 1916. The figure of a rectangle is drawn and the dimensions are given. Two methods are used to calculate the length of the diagonal. This tablet suggests that the Babylonians may have known the Pythag Pythagorean theorem for the right triangle. This appears to be certain a certainty when we consider two among the mathematical problems in cuneiform text uh, 9. It was less than nine months ago that the meaning of these two problems became clear. It is impossible now to know whether Pythagoras learned about this famous proposition during his travels in search of more light, or whether he rediscovered it by sheer force of thinking along similar lines. One can only admit with certainty that it awaited the independent efforts of astronomers Adams of Cambridge and Leverrier of Paris, but these two were contemporaries, whereas an interval of some 1,500 years separated Pythagoras from Akkad, and an interval of great significance if the doctrine of reincarnation to be taken into account. Regarding this 47th proposition and its adaption or adoption, as the design for a master's pa uh, past master's jewel by the Grand Lodge of England, there is a valuable illustrated article by a worshipful brother, Reverend W. W. Covey Crump, in the 34th volume, 1935-36, of the Transactions of Leicester Lodge of Research, including uh, included in the nine diagrams are two which the learned author states might well be Pythagorean because of their known antiquity, but to reproduce them here is not practicable, so I can only refer to those interested to this source. Another, an exhaustive treatise, The Pythagorean Proposition, with many diagrams, was published in 1927 by an Elisha Loomis, Ph.D., 32nd degree, uh, Mason, of Baldwin Wallace College in Cleveland, Ohio, a very large volume entitled uh, Restorations of Masonic Geometry and Symbolitry or Symbolry, uh, and illustrated and illustrated with 30 plates and colors of this proposition and its components, was compiled by uh, M.W. Brother H.P.H. Bromwell of Illinois and published in 1905 by a committee of the Grand Lodge of Colorado, of which he was an honorary member. Copies of these three items can be consulted in our Grand Lodge reference library. As to a symbolic value, this is truly a speculative matter, and in view of the reference to uh, Philos, there appear no grounds for even assuming that its discoverer may have used it other than as a geometrical demonstration of spatial properties. History, especially religious history, contains many unfortunate results accruing from reading into our inheritance from the past, our own interpretations based on modern knowledge and theories, and these can be found too in all three schools of Masonic exegesis, or exegesis, I don't even know that word. Turning now to the articles of Professor Cornford, the first point to be noted is that they are based entirely on quotations from Greek writers of the 5th and later centuries BC, so it seems advisable to include here a few details of their connections with the Pythagorean school in time as well as thought, so as to get both a correct perspective and to see the problem outlined for its readers. To begin with, there is an unexpected similarity in the setting of the school and that of a New Testament 
in that neither of their founders left any personal writings, or at least any of which are known as such, so that their followers, when necessity for such writings became evident, had to depend on their memories for whatever details they wished to preserve as the true teachings of their masters. From what we are told, these systems, it is certain that the Pythagorean is much more correctly presented by reason of the very definite training established in the school at Cortona. The earliest data allowed for any document or early date that's the earliest date allowed for any document of the New Testament by literary critics is I understand as 125 AD and Professor Cornford tells us that the Pythag Pythagoreans left us no literature before Philios who was a teacher at Cortona during the 4th century BC, about 100 years after the supposed death of his founder. There is also a parallel in the 18th century Freemasonry that in our earliest information of its esoteric details comes from those who were its most severe critics when they were not actually hostile to it, as seen in the various English and French exposures published between 1723 and 1801, of which about 30 are known. The early method of teaching from mouth to ear, still faithfully used in the Grand Lodge of Ireland, was then prevalent in the Senior Grand Lodge of England, except then for exoteric matters of history and constitutional growth. These exposures, given modern Masonic students a serve as valuable as it was foreign to their writer's intentions. The first of these Greek critics was Par Parmenius, and uh, who was born about the time that the uh, Pythagoras died, and he was a pupil at Cortona. It seems that he had disagreed violently with some of the founder's teachings, so he left and started an institution of his own at Elia, as now known as the Elia. I'm not going to be able to pronounce that. Elatic, Eliac, Attic School. He was succeeded by Zeno, who had worked up from being a pupil at Elia to rank of leader, and under him the new body diverged still further from its source. With Zeno were associated other philosophers, notably uh, Empedocles and Anacles. Anaxagoras, I don't know, who attended great reputations for their capacities in argument and assertion. We find then by the beginning of the 3rd century BC when Aristotle was born, whose writings are frequently quoted by Professor Cornford, that the Greek world of philosophy was divided, broadly speaking, into two main systems. First, that of Pythagoras, which progressed through Socrates to his full flower in Plato and taught an ever-becoming plurality of the Creator in the created or the mystical schools. Uh, second, that of Parmenius, uh, was, uh, uh, was through Zeno and best set forth by Aristotle, or a scientific school based on an infinite number of monads or atoms which have an inherent power of movement and intelligent cooperation now known as atomism and uh, since I am concerned here only with Pythagoras this other system will not be mentioned again <laughs> the system of atoms um, of all that is definitely ascribed to Pythagoras of symbolic teaching, the most famous seems to be his uh, Tetractus or to the Tetrad, and uh, uh, said to be a compendium of Pythagorean mysticism. It is shown as a group of one of points from one to four, arranged as a pyramid, and presents the elements of number which are the elements of all things, and contains the concordant ratios of harmony in the musical scale as discovered by Pythagoras. In connection with this musical scale, it seems fitting to note here the recent publication of a book, The Greek Alos, a study of its mechanism and its relation to the model system of ancient Greek music by K. Schlesinger, uh, Mithun's London Illustrated, for ten bucks. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why he threw the money in there, but anyway, Elus is usually uh, translated as flute, 
as a flute, and but actually means any wind instrument from the war horn of Mars to the reed pipe of Pan, including the double pipe used in religious and other processions. processions. The author spent many years over his work starting from the original flutes in British Museum where there is a large collection all having this feature in common that the holes are pierced equidistantly, uh, equidistantly equi equally distant in other words having a facsimiles made an even greater problem presented as was to discover the law of acoustics which governed their scales so different from ours. It was found to be based on the mathematical ratios of the harmonic series but reversed. It was also found that modes based on this archaic scale showed not only a remarkable range in producing small intervals but also that all the tones of the scale may be sounded together with harmonious results, an impossibility with the piano or violin. This discovery amounts to a new language of music, and composers are already using it in concert work. Returning to the Tetris, we find that it is, I'm just going to talk to Tetrad, and it, we find it is known as the Decade, and uh, its points all total 10, which was held to be the perfect number because 11 and 12 and their, and their successors are merely increments to the decade and not the production of a new source. These integral numbers and their combinations are the subject of many volumes of explanation by Greek philosophers. They are not easy to follow, but the patient scholarship of Professor Cornford in quoting from many writers makes it possible to present a coordinated mosaic pavement whereon to approach the sanctuary. It seems clear that the Pythagoreans regarded number both as a matter of things and as their properties and states. The elements of number are even and odd, of which is even, un even is unlimited and odd limited. One or unity consists of both, for it is both odd and even, positive and negative, same difference. Number proceeds from one, and the numbers contain the whole. This statement may be further explained. First, there is the identification of the even with the unlimited and the odd with the limited or limit in Euclid's definition of even and odd in book. Uh, 767 seems to be derived from the Pythagorean definitions given by Aristocinos, Plato, and two in his uh, Euthypro symbolizes even by isosceles the, and odd by a scaling figure. Plutarch explains further since even numbers start with two odd numbers with three and five is generated by the combination of these five has rightly received honor as the first product of first principles and has been named marriage because the even is like the female and the odd like the male for when numbers are divided into equal parts the even is completely parted asunder and leaves within itself as it were a receptive principle or space, whereas when the odd is treated in the same manner, there is always left over a middle, which is generative, and again, when the numbers are equally divided in the uneven number, a unit is left over in the middle, while in the even there is left a masterless and numberless space, showing it is defective and imperfect. And you, I want you to pause it here and I want you to read that paragraph I just read. I'm not going to read it over for you. I want you to read it to yourself and digest it. Okay, so you pause it right here for a second and read that paragraph again. It's for your own good. Trust me. Understanding doesn't come immediately. Alright, so uh, I'll continue. Thus, the dyad, as the first even number, stands for the female receptive field, the void womb of unordered space, an evil principle of the unlimited, the triad, as its opposite, the good principle of limit, the male whose union with the unlimited produces the limited, or, as Aristotle says, the universe and all things in it are limited or determined by three, the numbers five, 
2 plus 3 and 6 2 times 3 are both symbols of the marriage of even and odd of unlimited and limit or positive and negative. One very essential Pythagor Pythagorean dogma arises from this that the monad is, or monad it consists of both odd and even and does not proceed from them. This is a formula common to the most early stories of creation. It is picturesquely set forth in one of the plays of Euripides wherein Melanippe the wise or Melanippe the wise says the tale is not mine, I had it from my mother, that heaven and earth were once formed, and when they had been sundered from another, they gave birth to all things and creatures that the scale sea breeds, scale, uh, uh, I suppose to say scale sea, and the race of mortal men. The other writers discarded the imagery of sex, but told a similar story on an impersonal basis. Yet others showed this process as a war of aggression, the pairs of opposites invading each other's province unjustly to form those temporary combinations which are living beings. And you can also use a symbol, I'm going to pause again here just to give you an image. You can also use in what they're talking about here in this, this invasion of space, the, the imagery of the Pacific of Pisces. And you have the two space on the inner side, and you have the middle space, the empty space. All right, so the next state, you know, just to, a comparison. Um, the next stage in explaining is the same thing with two cells merging. Um, and, and the same thing with the energy fields when I talked about in my reality series. When you're merging two energy fields together, you get the same effect. All right, so the next stage in explaining the tetrasis or the tetrad is the identification of four as the first square number, justice, and is therefore of special interest to Freemasonry. This justice, however, is just much is much more mosaic than Masonic, and since the world so translated as is anti pepunts which also means retaliation and shows the primitive idea of balance, an eye for an eye, etc. To temper justice with mercy by paying a penalty on the installment plan while the necessary lesson is being learned does not appear as an ethical teaching until Christianity was founded. The extreme limit of application of the Tetrad appears in Pythagoras' teaching about music as the unlimited range of musical sounds is marked off by consonant numbers in the to the dif, uh, definite intervals of the musical scale. Sorry, I messed that up. Let me read it again. As the unlimited range of musical sounds is marked off by consonant numbers into the definite intervals of the musical scale so that the blank field of darkness is marked off by those boundary points of heavenly light the soon the the soon the sun the moon the stars and planets whose orbits still conceived as material rings are set at musical intervals to form the celestial harmony or scale bridging and binding together the visible order from earth at the center to the outermost spheres of the fixed stars now this majestic order was evolved not and is not evident and there is no sign that the earliest pythagoreans went further and what there's talking about here is that this is the the music of the spheres and uh the frequency, the harmonic scales, which when you get into the the, 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 the founding of reality and what the, the words, like when he says the word, uh, you're actually speaking of vibration and scale. So, but I feel free to suggest that if Professor Cornford were equally familiar with the Vedic scriptures of India, and we read about those earlier in another reading, a couple of readings ago, is the, or one reading ago actually, uh, as he is the Akustamasta or Akustamata of Greece, he might well have added that Pythagoras had received this further illumination during his stay in that country. As another scholar, Max Muller, 
has shown us in his many translations from the sacred books of the East, notably the hymns of the Rig Veda, and Brother Hutchinson has this same idea in a footnote to his lectures referred above. Another aspect to be considered is the geometrical character of the, Pythag the Pythagorean arithmetic arithmetic indeed or arithmetic indeed we are told that he uh, identified geometry with science in general it is very suggestive to note that his word used here by uh, Iamblichus uh, and translated science is historia which also means any learning by the processes of inquiry no less than the narration of what is one has learned it is through this time value that this word has been adopted into English as history. In the unlimited darkness of all of night all objects lose to the eye their color and shapes. In the daily renewed creation in the dawn of light they resume their distinct forms, their surfaces and colors. This in the physical world light, the vehicle of knowledge, acts as a limiting principle which informs the blank darkness with bodies bounded by measurable planes and distinguished by all the varieties of color. A body is thus a visible thing in which two opposite principles meet, the unlimited darkness in space and the limited color and form. It is again very suggestive to Freemasons that the word here translated as color form is schema which has been adopted into English as the equivalent for a plan and does not the phrase the great architect inevitably connote the application of a plan. True to its mathematical character this teaching tends to conceive any sensible as Thomas Taylor called them as essentially a geometrical solid whose surfaces are ultimately reducible to numbers and their inner relations. This is the mode of conception applied in Plato's Timaeus to the atoms of the four elements and in this way things represent numbers. Most of Aristotle's allusions to the doctrine of Pythagoreans refer to this theory and there is only one kind of number namely mathematical number that this number does not exist separately but senses our sensibles are composed of it indeed they construct the whole heaven of number and these numbers do not consist of abstract units but are conceived as having spatial magnitude they are described as being indivisible magnitudes things or bodies are identified with numbers composed of these indivisible magnitudes these numbers are generated just as the rest of the sensible world is you know and he's talking about the code this is the time of the code here. The code that makes up your reality. That's the that's what's represented like in the matrix and you see all the numbers and they use the, the green background on this is what's represented here. The symbol the symbolic uh, symbolically. Uh, it seems clear that whenever whatever simplicity may have marked the original teachings of Pythagoras, they became more complex as they passed through the minds of his successive principles at Crotona. Since it developed into the theory of bodies or sensibles being collections of monads, but there is an implication that there is w there which here which is not brought out by the word collection, as a translation of the Greek systema, this in its modern form as system implies an arrangement in some de definite coordination, which collection does not. We should not lose sight of this in any talk of mere spatial units. I suggest that such a system has been evolved for use by modern and analytical chemistry, which portrays the known physical elements and their combinations in graphs, such as in AOH for water, or in, you know, comma saw all their uh, abbreviations and acronyms. Um, Time, no less than space limits, obliged me to omit much interesting argument and illustration contained in Professor Cornford's articles, so I will close our consideration of the tetrad by some references to its shape. And the professor thinks the Pythagoreans confused the physical process of building bodies with the so-called processes of arith arithmetical generation and geometrical 
construction. They had not faced the questions or the question which puzzled Socrates, how one and one can become two or how division can be the cause of one becoming two. There was some idea of the growth or generation of a solid by flowing of a point into a line, of a line into a surface, and of a surface into a solid. Now, the first and simplest solid is the tetrahedron, or pyramid, which has four triangular faces. This is readily identified with the atom of fire and the principle of limit. And Aristotle stated that fire is the only element having a pyramidical form. Indeed, our word pyramid means fire-shaped. He has also stated that certain Pythagoreans held the doctrine that the soul is fire, or composed of atoms of fire, and because, uh, because of this can penetrate anywhere as a fire atom is the most piercing of all. Plato deals with this theory in his dialogue in Tale Parmenides, if you wish to follow it further. But it is certainly true that in the above-mentioned Rig Veda, which is of much greater antiquity, the human soul is referred to as a spark of divining fire. And its most revered hymn, the Gaurati, is a prayer for reunion therewith. No teaching of the mysteries can point to anything further or better than such a reunion, whatever the path by which it is accomplished. And it's signed by N.W.J. Hayden. I thank you for joining me.